for any of you that missed it last week, don't forget that you can now get super sick as Hans merch. Get that Hans Tuatara on shirts, hoodies, phone cases, cushions, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Just go to historyaotearoa.com and click the merch button in the menu. Kia ora, g'day, and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 25, Industry of Flax. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about the various items Māori were making using the technique of weaving, with a bit of a focus on the kākahu, cloak, an iconic piece of Māori attire. This time, we're going to follow a bit of a neat thread I found while researching this topic. It does sit slightly outside the scope of these weaving episodes, but I thought it would be fun for a bit of variety, and at least give you a small glimpse into the kind of place Aotearoa would become. We will still be talking about harakeke, but we will look at the industry that formed around it after the arrival of Europeans to its eventual collapse in the late 20th century. So let's jump forward, from our time when Europeans and Māori never knew the other existed, to a time when European contact was fairly regular. We're talking late 18th, early 19th centuries, where mukka is a valuable trade item for both cultures. For Europeans, the fibre is able to be used to replace damaged ropes on their ships, which in this era are the big sailing ships powered by canvas and wind, which rope was an integral part of maintaining and operating the vessel. For Māori, trading something that Europeans wanted meant they had access to the technological advancements that they brought with them. It just so happened that one of the key technologies Māori were interested in receiving for their fibre was guns. Lots of guns. Specifically the musket, which would cause all sorts of problems and lead to the quite simply named musket wars. But that story is for another day. Initially, the main market was the sealers and whalers, who began to frequent Aotearoa after its second discovery. However, they also attempted to imitate the techniques that Māori used to produce mukka from the flax leaf, with the intention of exporting it. Their attempts were unsuccessful though, as they didn't really know what they were doing, and often damaged the fibre during the process, and eventually the reputation of its quality when trying to sell it. It actually wouldn't be until the 20th century when proper quality controls came in to ensure no one was making a crap product. By the 1820s and 30s, flax was being exported in larger and larger quantities to Australia and Britain, as well as being used by the new settlers for clothing, rope, sails, and sacking. That is, sacks for, like, potatoes and stuff, not, like, sacking a town. Low-quality flax was also being sent to Britain during the 1830s to make paper that could last over 150 years. We know this because that very information was written on a piece of flax paper. Although it was a bit nasty to look at, being yellow-brown in colour and very coarse, Its durability was quickly noted, and the paper was actually deemed suitable for making paper banknotes in 1865, but the Reserve Bank rejected the idea. Which I think is a bit of a shame. Maybe it should make a comeback. Although this fairly amenable trading continued up until the 1850s, there was evidence to suggest that Māori were sometimes a bit reluctant to trade, and were difficult to negotiate with, especially when it came to pricing. This has been put down to some other evidence that suggests Māori were expected to provide cheap labour and free information on how to process harakeke, something that they didn't seem too keen on sharing with their new neighbours. The flax trade also declined a fair amount post-1840, when the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, which would be a spark for a series of conflicts known as the New Zealand Wars or Land Wars, naturally causing everyone to be a bit less focused on trade. In saying that though, some historians suggest that trade declined for more complicated economic reasons. Reasons that I don't really understand, so I won't get into them. And that the wars sparked the move to mechanisation, 
which would define the industry until its demise over a hundred years later. In fact, Lieutenant Governor King, upon seeing Tuki and Huru try to teach flax processing to prisoners, realised that the process would need to become mechanised, especially if it was to ever get off the ground as a viable industry. And that was way back in 1793. It wouldn't be until the 1860s when flax stripping machines would be designed and begin production. These machines could produce 250 kgs of mucca fibre a day, which in and of itself is just an insane amount, but it's made even more mad when you compare it to the amount that could be done by hand in the same amount of time, which was about 1 kg. By 1910, so about 50 years later, improvements to the machines and processes made this number quadruple to 1.27 tonnes, which is just an absolutely staggering amount. The machines were used in what was known as flax mills, mostly located in Manawatu, the region where modern Palmerston North is, but they were located all across the country from Northland to Southland. Aren't we just great at naming stuff? In 1870, there were 161 mills operational in New Zealand, totalling about 1,700 workers, which increased to 3,000 by 1890. Before we talk more about the industry, we should probably talk about how the new machine process of extracting fibre from harakeke worked. Despite the increase in production capacity and the ability to not have to do everything by hand, flax milling was still no mean feat. Most flax mills were built next to swamps, where flax tended to thrive, and about 20 to 50 workers would go out into the swamp and cut flax, tying them into bundles to be brought back to the mill. These quote-unquote flaxies, as they were known, were often Māori contractors, and a skilled flaxy could cut 3 tonnes of flax a day, with 8 to 9 tonnes of flax leaf required to make 1 tonne of fibre. Once the leaves were brought back, they were fed through the stripping machine, which made a loud shrieking noise. Although, this wasn't the worst part. This was likely held by the bloke who had to sit under the machine, catching the slimy fibre coming out and bunching it all up. Now, this wasn't the worst part because it was a crap job, although it probably was. No, this was the worst part because the spot where the guy sat to catch the slimy stuff was called a quote-unquote glory hole. And I am not making that up. I really wish I was. Parents, I am sorry for having to make you explain that to your kids. Anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's move on. The fibre that had been bunched up was then washed, dried, and bleached in a paddock for 10 days. After being taken out of the paddock, the fibre was run through a scooching machine, which would take off more material and remove water, refining it further so it could be packed into bales for local delivery or export overseas. A much more straightforward process than doing it by hand, but still just as gruelling, and probably a lot louder than the hand method perfected by Māori. With these tough working conditions came unions, and a few famous Kiwis came out of these unions. The one you are most likely familiar with is Michael Joseph Savage, the head of the first Labour Party government and New Zealand's Prime Minister from 1935 to 1940 upon his death in office, but we probably know him better as the guy who gave Bob Semple his ministerial office of public works, leading him to develop the world's greatest tank. Between 1901 and 1918, 5% of the principal exports in New Zealand were flax, which naturally made it a sizable chunk of the economy. 5% in fact. This did fluctuate though, depending on the conditions in the outside world. For example, wars tended to increase the need for flax, such as during the Spanish-American War, which decreased the availability of manila, a type of fibre also used for ropes as well as unrest in Mexico, decreasing the availability of sisal, another fibrous plant for ropes. And of course, the First World War. Which, by the way, 
is when many of these flax mills were operated by those not fit for battle, that is, older men and teenage boys. By the 1920s though, this booming industry was in decline. A little before this time, flax plants were being infected with yellow leaf disease, a bacteria-caused insect-borne disease which caused problems such as stunted growth and premature flowering. There were many attempts and strategies to curb the growing epidemic, such as flooding plantations, different cutting techniques, or growing resistant varieties, but they were met with mixed results. Adding to this the onslaught of the Great Depression, the New Zealand flax industry was sent into a death spiral. Part of what made the industry difficult to recover from a hit like that was the fact that it never really grew beyond small, family-owned mills into a large-scale industry that could take a share of the global market. A global market, I might add, that was saturated and had fibres circulating that everyone was more familiar with. One such flax mill was the Templeton Flax Mill, which originally opened in 1943 and closed in 1972, and has been owned by the same family right up until the present day. The reason I mention this particular mill is twofold. Firstly, because it's near Riverton, which is in my home province of Southland. But secondly, and more importantly, it is known as the Templeton Flax Mill Museum, the only flax mill museum in the country. Due to this, and its preservation of the original machines, the museum was granted Category 1 status by the New Zealand Historic Places Trust, now called Heritage New Zealand, which is a crown entity funded by Te Manatū Taonga, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage, who basically ensure the survival of New Zealand's historic buildings. The best thing about the Templeton Museum, though, is that not only can you go and learn about how the machines work, you can see how the machines work. The museum actually still produces harakeke fibre, which are bought by weavers as well as overseas film companies. There was even a Taranaki vintage car restorer that used the offcuts for upholstery. Oh, that's so cool! Anyway, adding to the problem of these family-owned enterprises was that they sold to middlemen who then sold the fibre to overseas merchants naturally cutting into their margins. Even worse still, the product they were exporting was the raw fibre, meaning the actual manufacturing process into finished products was occurring in other countries, giving them the benefit of the most economically valuable part of the entire supply chain. Despite these issues and their resulting death spiral, the flax industry lasted another half century, so that begs the question of what kept it going. Well, it was mostly saved by government intervention, resulting in a switch in focus. In 1934, New Zealand Woolpack and Textiles Limited was formed, which was subsidised by the government. The idea behind this was to keep the industry afloat by transitioning from a focus on export of raw fibre to the manufacture and domestic sale of primarily wool packs which are basically big sacks farmers put wool into. Other items were also manufactured, such as underfelt, baler twine, floor coverings, upholstery, and all sorts of other things. This was also combined with restriction on imports from overseas wool packs, and continued experimentation with different flax varieties. Some plantations in Wanganui and Taranaki may have existed to try and perform selective breeding to improve quality and yield, though it was apparently too much work and the swamp method of clearing out weeds and draining seemed to be more preferable. The restrictions and subsidies continued into World War II and beyond, helping keep the industry afloat until 1972, the year the Templeton Flax Mill closed. The restrictions were lifted, and the subsidies ceased, with wool pack production ceasing with them. This was attributed to customers in Japan complaining that fibre from the wool packs contaminated the wool when it was shipped to them. Despite this, the industry still lived on, producing other products. But in 1973, New Zealand Wool Pack and Textiles Limited was taken over by Stevens Brenner, a major carpet producer. 
Stevens Brinmer phased out most flex-based products until the company was acquired by Feltex New Zealand in 1980. Eventually, the right to manufacture and sell felt, one of the last products to ever be made of commercial flax, was sold to another group, Bonded Felts Limited, whose headquarters were destroyed by fire in 1985, which effectively ended the New Zealand flax industry. That is, I guess you could say, a brief overview of the timeline of the industry. And there have been many ideas as to why New Zealand flax never really took off. Some we have already mentioned are that the Reserve Bank never took it up to make banknotes, the nature of the saturated worldwide market, the fact the industry never was terribly cohesive locally and didn't innovate much in terms of plants, plus of course, disease and the Great Depression. Other more specific factors that historians have also put out that may have contributed is the colonial idea that New Zealand was subordinate to her mother country, Britain, with British lawmakers favouring British manufacturers over colonial ones. This was seen all over the world, not just here in New Zealand, with Britain at one point requiring colonies to send their exported goods direct to them, before they could go to their intended destination so that they could clip the ticket. All of these factors also led to the death of a similar industry, Indian jute, in 1894. To almost illustrate this, New Zealand flax was actually sent to Britain numerous times to try establish the industry there during and after World War I. This was spearheaded by the Royal Botanic Gardens Q in conjunction with other groups, and met with a variety of success and failure, the failures mostly occurring in Scotland and Ireland. Although the industry lasted over 150 years, warning signs could have been seen as early as 1828. You see, the British Navy at the time had been considering using harakeke fibre for ropes. As you might imagine, this would have been huge. Although Harakeke would hardly be the sole source of fibre used, His Majesty's Navy was massive. The most massive in the world, in fact. They were the largest end user of the product at the time, so it came as a massive blow in 1828 when they rejected Harakeke as a source of fibre, on the grounds that it was expensive to cultivate, there was uncertainty through bad crops, and availability of more familiar fibres. Problems we have seen come up elsewhere in this episode. This was done in spite of the fact that the same complaints could be made of other products, especially since the distance, a key factor in the expense equation, had not been an issue for the meat, wool and dairy industries, which became cornerstones of the New Zealand economy. There was also the option of using mucca prepared by Māori, which was of much higher quality than that of machine-made fibre. However, As we have mentioned, it was slow to produce, being made by hand, and Māori had their own concerns regarding trade, especially as most of the iwi that controlled said trade were in Northland, resulting in conflict between iwi for more control of that trade. In fact, instead of harakeke and muka, food was actually a major source of income for Māori, provisioning the ships of early European explorers to Aotearoa. I hope you have enjoyed this look into the New Zealand flax industry, from its beginnings as trade between two peoples, to industrialisation, rise and decline. I also hope you have enjoyed our look into Māori weaving in general, as this is our last episode on it. These last few episodes have been awesome to research and write, so I hope you have learned at least one cool new fact to tell your mates. We can't keep looking backwards though, We got to look forwards, which I realise is super ironic, given this is a history podcast. Anyway, you're probably wondering what's on the horizon. Well, given it's the end of 2019 when I'm recording this, this will be our last history-focused episode of the year. That doesn't mean you won't get any Hans for the next couple of months. It just means we won't start our next topic until next year. That topic will be a big one, covering at least four episodes, and will be a rather personal one for a lot of people. 
so I don't want to split it up with some of the other episodes planned for the rest of the year. The topic, if you are wondering, will all be about tamoko, the famous art of Māori tattooing. Next time though, we return to more exploits of our favourite trickster demigod, Maui, and how he pulled up to Ika'a Maui and got shipwrecked in the process, creating what we now know today in English as the North, South and Stewart Islands. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can reach me through email at historyaotearoa at gmail.com or Twitter at historyaotearoa or Facebook at History Aotearoa New Zealand Podcast. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. This podcast is a one-man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, buy merch or rate us on itunes or your preferred podcast platform it means a lot and helps us grow spreading the story of aotearoa new zealand as always hari tu atu hockey to my see you next time <laughs>